There are those that would say that in a world of such iconically embodied moral absolutes, the Punisher is a necessary, even welcome shade of grey. That Frank Castle, for all his brutality and mercilessness, operates within a remarkably lucid worldview. Those that trumpet Frank Castle's supposed valor believe that amongst all the Captain Americas and Doctor Dooms of the world, the Punisher represents a middle ground that is both reasonable and productive. The fight, those people would argue, between good and evil is less important than the battle between effective and ineffective. The never-ending cycle of debt between those who deserve revenge and those who deserve, well, punishment. However, upon further analysis of Frank's character, the opposite indeed holds true. Beyond Frank's supposed gray area lies a rigid moral absolutism of his own, a belief that to do wrong is to be deemed fit for death, and that he has been called to perform a righteous culling. Dive any deeper than surface level into the Punisher's psyche, and his rigorous practice of ruthlessness melts away, revealing a thickly veiled excuse for a man who tragically lost his family to wage war on something, anything, in order to exercise his deeply violent emotional trauma. More than anything, the Punisher needs someone to punish. That said, the character of Frank Castle is an exceedingly interesting one, and an extremely worthwhile character in the Marvel pantheon. But the Punisher should never be misconstrued as some misunderstood hero. At his worst, Frank Castle is nothing more than a loaded gun, looking desperately for something to be pointed at. The Marvel one-shot Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe shows us just what would happen if Marvel's resident murdering machismo was pointed in a slightly different direction. Number 1. Calamity at Central Park Our story opens with a sadly common scene playing out on the streets of Hell's Kitchen, NYC. A young Matthew Murdock is being tormented and beaten by the neighborhood bullies, unwilling to strike back against the thugs. Their taunts of daredevil, daredevil ring out amongst the hustle and bustle of the big city. Get up, Murdock! Come on! Daredevil! sings one of the bullies as he winds back to strike his target again. Until a calm and intimidating voice softly sounds as the boy's arm is grabbed from behind. Leave him be, says the young Frank Castle as he steps forward to break up the skirmish. Why? The young boy who would grow up to become Daredevil asks as his savior helps him up. I hate bullies, Frank responds. You don't hit them back, they're just gonna keep hurting you, Matt. Only way to stop them. Skip forward to the present, and the scene at Central Park is one of utter mayhem and destruction. The combined forces of the Avengers and the X-Men desperately defend against the strange and terrifying army of alien invaders, seeking nothing less than utter world domination. It's quite literally another day at the park for the super teams, but as with most super slugouts, the collateral damage is substantial. In fact, the price of the day's victory would be higher than any of the heroes involved could have imagined. Racing towards the park as the battle rages on is Frank Castle, a young city cop of some designation. His partner asks, Damn it, Castle, what's the matter with you? They said hold. But Frank replies only, They said the park. My wife took the kids to the park. When the two men arrive, the scene is one of complete destruction. It seems as though the brood and the scroll had intended a joint infiltration, only to be stifled by the Earth's most prominent super squads. But when Frank Castle arrives, he cares not for the triumph of the heroes. He cares only about their failures. Castle arrives just in time to see Daredevil verbally berating Cyclops of the X-Men. You rip the park apart with lasers and force blasts and God knows what, Daredevil lectures. And you expect not to hurt any innocents? Who else but Captain America comes to the mutant leader's defense? We only learned of the alien force at the last second. We had no time to clear the area. But Daredevil isn't near finished with his witness. This woman is dead. Her children are dead. And... But Cyclops quickly offers his own rebuttal, failing to see the distraught man approaching the scene of the slain family. It was unavoidable in a crossfire like that, Cyclops starts. Then, are you, uh, were they your, I'm sorry, we, we didn't know they were there. The leader of the X-Men offers Frank meekly. Unsurprisingly, the apology isn't nearly enough to sate the white-hot rage bubbling up inside of Castle's chest. You're sorry? He scoffs before he wordlessly whips out his pistol and puts two bullets directly into Cyclops' skull. As quickly as he dispatched their leader, Frank whips around at the rest of the X-Men and lets rip a series of shots that take out the Avenger Hawkeye and the mutant hero Jubilee in quick succession. The quickest to act, long-standing berserker of the X-Men Wolverine lunges at Castle with hate in his eyes and dispatches the man, brutally scarring Frank's face in the process. 
Let me go. He killed her. He killed them all. He killed them all. Screams Logan as Colossus desperately holds his teammate back from killing the man. At that, Frank is taken away by the authorities to stand trial for his extremely public triple homicide. The trial is brief, and even though Frank Castle is represented by none other than the genius legal mind of Matthew Murdock, he is sentenced to life imprisonment for his murder of several high-profile heroes. But while on his way to a cell and a thrown-out key, Frank's prison transport is intercepted by one Kesselring, who reveals himself to be an outcast billionaire who was horribly scarred when, as he explains, Dr. Doom threw the human torch at my car. Kesselring introduces Mr. Castle to an entire underground society of wealthy, like-minded individuals whose lives have been destroyed by superhuman activity. Sometimes they got a mumbled, insincere apology, sometimes not, Kesselring explained. Nobody really cared. When Frank asks what on earth the society wants with a Vietnam veteran disgraced in the public eye, Kesselring puts it as simply as he can. We want you to punish them. He explains, a glint of excitement ringing for the first time in his voice. We want them all, the heroes and the villains, the mutants and the monsters, anything that calls itself superhuman. We want you to kill them all. Kesselring promises to fully fund the endeavor. Supplies, data, equipment, he offers it all to help Castle succeed in his newfound mission. Frank, still sore with grief and rage, accepts. But before we see who's next on Frank Castle's terrifying hit list, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on to never miss an upload, and smash that like button for some plot armor today. And buckle up folks, the worst is yet to come. Number 2. It's Punishing Time Deep in the sewers of New York City, Spider-Man is locked in combat against one of his fiercest and slimiest foes, Venom. However, as the two web-slingers dodge and twist around one another, Peter Parker begins to feel something creep into the back of his mind. Hold it! He yells, even as Venom's claws near his masked face. Spidey senses tingling, something behind me! Suddenly, barbed tasers from all directions fire out at the two combatants, finding purchase both in Spidey's skin and Venom's, uh, well, goop. These little wires won't stop us, Venom roars, expecting another trick from his old foe. But this is a trap set by a different predator entirely. Suddenly, enough electricity to down a rhinoceros charges through the wires into both Spidey and Venom. When the electrocution ceases, they both lie in the dirty sewer water, barely alive. When the Punisher walks out of the shadows, he unceremoniously executes the mumbling Eddie Brock, before turning to look the wounded Spider-Man directly in the eyes. Stop! What? Who? Spidey manages. A hardened, chalky voice returns an answer. The Punisher. Punish? What for? Why us? Peter asks, confused and terrified as the barrel of Frank's gun lowers to meet his eyeline. Why me? Frank pulls the trigger without question or hesitation. Because somebody had to be first, the Punisher says solemnly as he turns away from his victims. Next, Frank regroups with his right-hand man, Micro, and the two prepare to take down their next, much more high-octane target. The Hulk rampages through Midtown Manhattan, with all authorities on site helpless to fight back against his raging might. Frank takes a much more careful approach, however, firing a single tracking dart into the Hulk's midsection, hiding the impact amongst the flurry of gunfire and screams that echo out from the scene. And now to wait for Hyde to revert to Jekyll. The Punisher thinks to himself. And sure enough, that night, Frank follows the ping from his tracking dart to an abandoned alleyway, where sleeping soundly, a destitute Dr. Bruce Banner barely manages to lift his eyelids before Frank puts a bullet in his skull as well. From there, Castle ramps up his war on the world. After the Hulk, Frank sets his eyes on the infamous Kingpin of New York. After letting Micro cripple his operations from inside, Frank goes in guns literally blazing. He finds the kingpin in his ivory tower, ready as ever to smash some heads. I took your threat to be exclusively against the superpowered community, Castle. The kingpin seethes as the two men clash against one another, the kingpin's overwhelming might making it supremely hard for Frank to get any clean shots off. I applauded you. I acquired a stockpile of weapons specifically to counter their power for your use. The King of Crime continues to berate Castle as Frank pulls two pistols from behind his back. I'd have assisted you with the full weight of my empire, the empire which your internet savages have dismantled over the last three days. Kingpin towers over Frank as he makes his final threat. You've taken everything from me. Now it's my turn. 
But just as Kingpin settles in to finish the job, Frank's two hidden sidearms whip around and begin laying into his target. Even so, Kingpin refuses to fall, stumbling closer and closer to the Punisher, yelling, Dead man! Dead man! Until finally, at the last possible second, Castle manages to nestle a gun into the Kingpin's neck and pulls the trigger. Of course, far from the sewers or the back alleys, this hit took place right in the public square. Frank was once again incarcerated for his killing spree, and once again represented by one Matthew Murdoch, who advises Castle, It won't bring your family back. It won't do any good at all. You've got to stop before this hatred of yours consumes you. Number 3. No Turning Back The Punisher doesn't spend long in prison, however, as his kindly benefactor Kesselring quickly moves to break his favorite hitman out of his cell. You've only hit a few of your targets, Kesselring warily confronts Frank. But cool as a murderous cucumber, Castle responds in kind. I've got the high-tech weaponry I needed from the Kingpin's lab, and I've got an idea how to speed things up. Soon after, high above the mountains of the infamous nation-state of Latveria, Frank's helicopter flies, disguised as the Fantastic Four's famous flying Fantasticar. Ought to have piqued his interest to let us in this close, Frank muses as they fly along peacefully. His quarry, the great and terrible Doctor Doom, is not known for his hospitable welcomes. Dressing up as his greatest rivals in order to gain entry is a stroke of genius so risky that only Frank Castle would dare attempt it. The ruse works like a charm. After parachuting down into the royal castle, Frank comes face to face with Doom for the first time. Though initially, it looks as though he might have wished he'd left the dictator alone. Puny insect, Doom rages. You are as nothing before the might of Doom. Your subterfuge was useless. I saw you land upon my castle walls. Now pay the price for your impudence, screeches the metal-clad doctor, preparing to strike the final blow into castle's chest cavity. But before he can let his empowered fist fly, Frank slips a small, unassuming metallic disc onto Doom's helmet. As the Latvarian monarch struggles to remove the magnetized machine, it works rapidly. The disc wires itself into Doom's internal circuits and shuts down all of his prolific Doombots, ensuring that Castle is facing the one true doctor rather than a decoy. As the feedback from the device bores itself into Doom's temples, he collapses from the shock, smoking and singed from the discharge of electrical energy. Magnetic mind won't dent that thick head, huh? Castle muses as he retrieves a hammer from a nearby wall. That's okay. We've got all the time in the world. With that, the sounds of Frank's hammer clanging against metal ring across the Latvarian countryside until a sickening squitch betrays that his victim's skull had finally given way. Later, deep within the labyrinthian maze of Doom's castle, Frank and Micro stand before an honest-to-goodness nuclear device. Isn't that a nuke, Micro asks? Yep. Frank replies, I was hoping we'd find something like this. And folks, nothing good has ever come of someone hoping to come across a nuclear warhead. Kind of people I'm up against, Frank explains to Micro. Guns and guts just ain't enough. Let's see what we can do with this equipment, Micro. Cause we're gonna have to get sneaky. Next, we cut to the surface of the moon. Yes, you heard that right, the moon. Upon which Magneto and his combined hordes of evil mutantdom face off against Cyclops' successor, Storm, who leads the X-Men as they valiantly stare down the villainous army that stands before them. Ironic indeed that our final conflict should be played out here upon the moon, Magneto monologues. Was this irony foremost in your mind when you lured us here, Storm? Or did you, in your simple way, miss it? Storm responds sternly, matching Magneto's dramatic tone. We, the combined X-Teams, cannot allow you, Apocalypse, and your unholy alliance of acolytes and evil mutants to continue in your wrongdoing. But it was you who chose the moon as our battlefield. We simply followed the direction of the challenge that you sent us, and came here, Storm explains. Both sides now look wary, as they realize that everyone here was assembled under false pretenses. They don't have long to consider the peculiarity, though. As just then, an atomic device created by none other than Doctor Doom emerges from the moon's surface and explodes with devastating effect, disintegrating nearly all of mutantdom in one terrible blast. Now there's one small step for all mankind, Micro muses as he watches through binoculars from the safety of Earth. However, not all of mutanthood was wiped out in one fell swoop. As the one called Wolverine sits, drunk and disorderly, wallowing in his grief and sadness at the state of the world. All my buddies die on the moon, and me and Japan on some lousy wild goose chase. Wolverine softly howls in defeat as he falls to his knees. The Avengers get fried in a teleporter accident. Someone floods the vault, drowns every creepo they're holding down there. I mean, I even heard they found Mr. Fantastic dead in a dumpster. 
but as Wolverine wails, a shadowy figure emerges from the street behind him with a familiar looking scar across his cheeks. I'm the one sent you chasing shadows in Japan while I did your buddies, runt. Frank mocks as he steps into the light, been saving you for a special occasion. Remember me? With this, Wolverine is sent into a deeper rage than he'd ever entered before. You dirty murdering piece of- he growls as he pops his famous claws. But the Punisher is ready for Logan, driving a punch directly into his neck. Wolverine stumbles, but quickly finds his footing as he slices Frank across the chest. Castle falls, but manages to kick Wolverine up and over him, sending the frothing X-Man into a nearby power plant. Psycho creep! Logan yells at Castle. You killed my friends! Killed my friends! Before unleashing his claws directly into the palm of Frank's hand. Wounded but still fighting, Frank struggles against Wolverine, softly saying, They <clears throat> killed my family as he grabs Logan's other claw and begins to sickeningly turn it on the mutant himself. And they said, sorry! Frank screams as he drives Wolverine's own claw deep into his chest and out the back. After tossing the defeated X-Man into the electric fuse, Wolverine is burned to a crisp on the spot. Thus, the Punisher wiped out all of mutant kind single-handedly. All in a day's work for Marvel's resident genocidal maniac. Number four. The Final Touches At this point, the Punisher had worked his way through just about every hero and villain in the Marvel canon. With deadly accuracy and terrifying precision, Frank Castle used his violent and horrific skill set to carve, shoot, stab, and explode his way through just about every single superpowered individual on the planet. He has succeeded beyond our wildest expectations, decreed Kesselring. In three short years, he has exterminated nearly 500 superhumans. He has been apprehended by the law only on two occasions, and freeing him has been comparatively simple. Nothing can stop him from completing the task we gave him. Kill them all. But even still, at the height of all this violence, one man still stands by Frank, hoping and praying that he will see the error of his ways. Matt Murdock, attorney by day, daredevil by night, pleads with the Punisher. You can't go on forever, Frank. Just because whoever it is keeps breaking you out doesn't mean you can escape your fate. Stop before you cause more bloodshed, either your own or... But Frank stops his lawyer there. He looks up at Murdoch with a question in his eyes. I've killed 500 times. I'm a mass murderer. The system failed me, Murdoch. It couldn't protect my family. It couldn't punish the guilty. It can't even hold me. So why do you care? Matt just looks back at the poor, broken man and says, In God's name, Frank. Because somebody has to. This gives the Punisher a moment's pause. But only a moment before he replies, I'm not stopping, Matt. Never. Forget about me. The Punisher's next target is one of immense emotional and personal importance to Frank. And who else could it be but the first Avenger, Captain America himself? When Frank finally cornered Cap in an abandoned warehouse, his guns proved no use against Cap's increased reflexes and shield work. That's the last of your bullets, Castle. The end of your weapons, Cap warns. Just you and me now. The steely, cold anger in Captain America's eyes pierces deep into the Punisher's soul. Cap approaches Frank and throws him straight through a nearby wall, showing his martial dominance over even one such as the Punisher. What happened to you, Castle? Cap asks, spitting the words with disgust. You were a soldier once. Now you're a disgrace. Frank spits blood onto the floor and wipes his lips. Yes, sir. I was a soldier. He says slowly, but I guess you could say I I once had myself a my lie kind of day. Cap is puzzled. A what? He asks. My lie, sir. Vietnam, Castle responds. Or have you forgotten the Nam? I know we didn't fight in the same circles. If you had, you'd know to scope out a scene before a battle, Frank says as he produces a gun from a nearby hiding spot with deadly speed and aim, like I did when I stashed this. You haven't been where I've been at all, Frank says solemnly, then continues. So who are you to judge? As he tenses his finger on his trigger, sending a bullet exploding from his chamber directly into Captain America's star-spangled skull. Now, the relationship between Frank Castle and Steve Rogers has always been a supremely interesting one. Steve, the brave American war hero who helped defeat the Nazis. Frank, the troubled Vietnam vet from one of America's most shameful moments. Neither valiant nor virtuous. 
This scene in particular reminds me of one of my all-time favorite Punisher moments from Marvel's first Civil War event, which lays out the differences between Castle and Rogers in stark clarity. At the height of the superhuman Civil War, Captain America's side was looking to bolster their numbers. Iron Man and S.H.I.E.L.D. had long since started using the Thunderbolts program to conscript convicted supervillains into service for their own ends, and Captain Rogers' reserve forces were growing thin. When a number of supercriminals approached Cap looking to join up with his side, the Punisher didn't even blink before gunning them down on the spot in front of everyone. Cap came down hard on Frank, calling him a murderous piece of trash and beating him mercilessly. But Frank refused to fight back. Not against you, he whispered through broken teeth. Afterwards, Cap briskly expelled Frank from his ranks. But what always stands out to me is Spider-Man's perspective on the situation. When Patriot asks, I wonder why he didn't hit Cap, Spidey responds, Are you kidding me? Cap's probably the reason he went to Vietnam. Same guy, different war. That one sentiment really sums up the relationship between Frank and Steve, and it makes their climactic final encounter during Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe all the more impactful. But as emotionally turbulent as Frank's final face-off against Cap was, nothing compared to his final three victims, each of which has their own lesson to teach the Punisher, lessons that would eventually end in tragedy. Frank begins his farewell tour at the home of his illustrious financial backer, Kesselring. The men and women who hired Frank raise a glass in his honor and toast to his name. But the glory they pay to the Punisher backfires, as Frank walks out of the festivities, cautioning, What I do is nothing to celebrate. I just do it. There's only one target left. Daredevil. I'm taking him out tonight. After that, you'll never see me again. This infuriates Kesselring, who is under the impression that Frank believed in the righteousness of their mission as much as anyone. Stop right where you are, the old man orders. We saved you from jail. We sent you on your mission. We gave your worthless life meaning, and you work for us. Kesselring made a common mistake in his dealings with Frank, mistaking the Punisher's cooperation for loyalty. I do what I do for me, Kesselring, Frank tells the man. After tonight, I'm through. Inevitably, this upsets Kesselring beyond recognition. The old man berates Frank for his lack of conviction, asserting that not only will Frank still work for him after Daredevil's death, but that the Punisher will be expected to murder every single new superhuman born into the world. Go to hell, Frank tells the crazy old millionaire. Stop, Kesselring shouts as Frank turns his back. You belong to us. I won't let you walk out of here like this. I mean it. This is the final straw. Frank's heavily trained arm moves faster than Kesselring can even pull his trigger, lifting his firearm from its holster and putting two slugs into the old man's chest. Silence falls over the room until Frank breaks the tension. If I ever hear from any of you again, he promises, I'll come back and kill you all. And with that, the Punisher leaves his sick, twisted sponsors to their drinks. Finally, Frank stalks the rooftops of Hell's Kitchen, looking for the last target on his list. But this hit is different. Frank knows that Daredevil could be his most difficult mark yet. Proving the point, Daredevil actually manages to sneak up on Frank rather than the other way around. An impressive feat in its own right. Welcome home, Frank. Daredevil's calm, even voice sounds from behind the Punisher. Back where it all began, hmm? Not for me, Frank tells his target. It began for me way uptown in the park five years ago. Hell's Kitchen means nothing to me now. But Daredevil sees through the pain and misery Frank wears like a shield. You're wrong, Frank, the masked Matthew Murdock says. Maybe you've just forgotten, but this is where it began. This angers Frank, who lashes out with a flurry of gunfire that just barely misses Daredevil as he flips up and over the hail of bullets. The Devil of Hell's Kitchen comes down hard on Frank as he lands, following up with multiple blows in quick succession. Daredevil even kicks Frank so hard that the Punisher completely falls off the rooftop and plummets down to the street below. Give it up, Frank. Daredevil warns politely, but still Frank hurls himself towards his prey. Desperate and sloppy, Daredevil follows up with a brutal knee straight to the Punisher's chin. As Frank collapses into the street, Daredevil's tone softens. Please, he asks, begging Frank to reconsider. You've killed just about everyone, Frank. Some very good people and some very bad people, but people all the same. And you murdered them all. But even here, at the end, Frank remains too staunchly dyed in his own colors to back out now. I killed a bunch of arrogant scum, he spits. You hide behind your masks and you think you've got the right to kick the world into the shape you want it to be. And too bad if anyone says different. Daredevil reaches down to take Castle's hand, to offer him an olive branch. 
But even as his target pleads, I'm begging you, let it end. Frank sees his opportunity and takes it. In one fluid motion, he grabs Daredevil's outstretched arm and pulls the masked vigilante in, driving a knife deep into the devil's chest. As he lies dying, Daredevil pulls off his mask, revealing the face of the attorney who never lost faith in Frank's rehabilitation. Matt? Castle yells at the realization. Murdoch lays on the street, his eyes shut as his body begins to shut down. There's always someone under the mask, Frank. Matt manages to say with his dying breath, but you killed us all. With that, the Punisher is left in cold silence. Standing above the body of his final target, Frank considers all that he's done. Looking down at Matt's dead body, he finally says, No, Matt. There's, as he pulls the barrel of his gun up to his own chin, there's one more to go, Frank says before pulling the trigger. A tragic but fitting final punishment for one whose crimes outnumbered any other. Thank you so much for watching the video. Do you have any favorite Punisher moments? Share them with us in the comments. Until next time, on behalf of all of us here at Plot Armor Comics, have a great day.